And Bill is host, we'll hit record and do the introductions, and I'll go ahead and sign off. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. Okay, so welcome you. everybody to this webinar in a series of webinars on data science education. It's been going on over a year now, I think. And uh, today's speaker is Andy Rubin, who's a senior scientist at Turk. Uh, Andy and I met in about 1993 uh, when uh, she came to Key Curriculum Press and talked to us about work that she was doing then, which did involve data, as I recall, gathering data from video. Um, yep. And uh, she and I have been working on and off on various projects um, ever since. And she has been um, a leader in um, thinking about uh, statistics education and now uh, data science education. Um, and uh, at, at, at many levels uh, from um, uh, elementary school through, through college. And right now she has a project that she's going to tell us some about uh, called Data Clubs. And uh, this is working with middle, middle school students. Anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I think I, I should say before I start that this project is relatively new. It's, hap it's been going on for about a year. So um, any kind of input that you might have might actually be incorporated. So that's just one thing. And um, in terms of participatory by design, I didn't actually craft any discussion questions, but I am open to interruption. And at various times, I'll probably pause and say, so what do you think about that? Um, but that's the extent of my having prepared for discussion. So I hope that's OK. Yes, of course it is. And um you can um, ask questions in the chat, and I will attempt to uh, follow those and relay them to Andy. Um, but if I fall, fall behind, don't hesitate to uh, choose a moment to interrupt the flow uh, or wait for one of those moments when Andy pauses for us to ask questions and make comments. Um, and uh, Talia, if you could uh, stop showing things. Um, this uh, video layout that we get in Zoom allows us to see those people who are willing to share their screens. Noise, and if that person could please mute, um, that would be very helpful. So. Um, Andy? All yes. You. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see, now I'm going to share my screen and I'm hoping that this is going to work. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure you wanted us to see your email. Well, no, but now it probably has gone away, I hope. Yes. <laughs> um, and now I want my slideshow to start, which, okay. Every time I, sorry, this is. Uh, oh yes, there's a thing that's in the way, isn't it? Yes, there is, and I'm trying to move it. There we go. There. All right, that, I think that will work. Um, does everyone see my screen and not anything else? Yes. My, okay, good. All right, so, um, so I'm gonna talk about this project called Data Clubs for Middle School Youth. Um, this is a project that we is NSF funded, we've had for about a year. It's from the STEM C program at NSF, whom we had to convince that data science was indeed um, integrating computing into STEM, which seems like an argument one shouldn't have to make, but we did. Um, and my big question is, um, if we have total freedom um, to make decisions about how we want to go about it, what can we do with middle school students in data science? Um, and when I say um, complete freedom, this is actually an out of school project, um, explicitly because we wanted to 
not have to think about what class does this happen in and what teacher are we going to engage. So um, that I just, we decided to give ourselves the best chance possible of making some progress and then we'll think about how that might happen in a more constrained context. Um, this is a collaborative project with the Maine Math and Science Alliance. So we actually have, uh, we'll have several data clubs here in Massachusetts and we'll have several in Maine. And one of the things we're interested in is, um, are there differences between rural and urban kids in terms of their interests around various data sources? So, um, whoops, let's see, there we go. Um, so let me do a bit of an overview of this project. Um, and, uh, and then I will, most of this, this talk is really in two parts. The first part is about the design criteria that we had for the modules. And the second part is a report on the first tryout of the first module that happened about two months ago. So um, we, as I said, decided to do this work out of school. And the two venues in which we'll be doing it are after school uh, clubs and summer camps. Um, about all we could get were 10 to 12 module, 10 to 12 hours per module. Um, it's hard to get that any more than that and have people, have kids be consistent attendees. So that's the amount of the exposure, the treatment is whatever people call it. Um, our participants in general are entering seventh and eighth grade, so they're 12 to 13 years old, although uh, this summer I think we had some 11 year olds and some 15 year olds, so it, you know, it's hard to, it's not like working in a seventh grade class, so there's a lot of variability in the people who are attending. And we propose to develop three modules, um, and the um, organizing principle of these modules as opposed to a kind of standard statistics thing, which might be um, looking at center or comparing groups, is really about topics. So this was one way in which we were taking advantage of the out-of-school context. We wanted to figure out what our kids interested in um, and what might they find data on particularly engaging, um, what kinds of questions might they really have. So as you'll see in a bit, um, we actually worked with uh, a focus group of kids to come up with topics and you'll see what we came up with. So one question is, what about data science do we hope that these young students can learn in 10 to 12 hours? Um, and below are, at least at the moment, our pedagogical goals. So one is just to make them aware that data are everywhere. Um, most kids think that data is the thing on your phone that you pay for, and we need to have them realize that's not the only meaning of the word data. But also that um, there's a process that changes life or reality or whatever you want to call it into data, and that's called measurement, and it requires a lot of decisions that you need to keep in mind because data and life are not the same. So you'll see how that came up in our current module. Um, we wanted students to know that there are cases and there are attributes. And I would say those are the two big statistical concepts that we, um, those are the vocabulary that we actually wrote up on a piece of paper, which no, you know that means they were important. Um, and we kept saying, what is a case here? What are the attributes? Um, and I would say that's not always easy to figure out what the case and the attributes are, but that we made, I would say we made progress in that. And that I believe that's a really important thing to understand. And then um, our other pedagogical goal is that some da any data set can be used to answer some questions, but not others. And so one of the things that we'll be developing, which we have not quite yet, is an instrument, an interview instrument that probes whether students can tell, given a data set, which questions could be answered and which ones couldn't, and possibly what else you would have to collect to answer questions that can't be answered with that data set. 
So that's not something you see in gays particularly in the guidelines for statistics education, but um, we think it's a really important skill and it's um, one that we don't think um, many people that have good control over. So, um, so those are the things that we were really hoping to, um, to help students be able to improve on. So let me stop and see if there are questions or comments. I have a question. Um, hi, can you hear me? Hi. <laughs> I'm Stefania uh, Druga. I just graduated from Media Lab course in Robots and work on AI education for kids. Uh -huh. in the same, I think in we've the same met. Uh, we exchanged emails, yes. Uh, okay. So I was curious, like, how did you, um, how did the design of these three modules came about? Like, why did you pick this, you know, particular modules? And if you had some sort of a pilot period where you were kind of testing to see if, you know, if the amount of uh, activities you wanted to do with the kids would work out with the time you had with them, or if the terminology was understood correctly. If you could talk a little bit about the iterative process that you mm -hmm. had in developing these three modules, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, actually, it's, it's a pretty easy answer because we're right in the middle of iterating. <clears throat> We've so far done one module uh, one time. So um, we're, and I could tell you some things that we realized we did wrong. Um, but I would say that there's still a lot to be learned. We have another module that's currently being developed in Maine is going to be taught in October. Um, I would say that at least, <laughs> this is kind of a funny answer, but I was, I was teaching the one this summer and I was exhausted after 10 hours. I don't know that I could have done any more, but that's a different question from um, was that the right amount of time? Um, I think we're partly, because we're working with community organizations that have um, schedules set up already, we, are, it wasn't our choice to have it be 10 hours. That was more their choice. So um, we're trying to see what fits into that time. Um, so that's one answer. Um, so we may end up having different goals because we don't have as much flexibility in terms of time. Um, and let me go, I, I, let me come back to that question because I think um, when I tell you how we came up with the topics, there, there was some iteration there. And when I um, tell you toward the end what I think we've learned, that points the way toward um, how we'll be changing things going forward. So um, the quick answer is we're just starting. So um, are there, I hope that's okay. I, and I will definitely push me back, um, later if, you, if I haven't answered that to your satisfaction. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And in a way- Other questions? I, just a comment. In a way, it's not surprising that you're just starting because we're all just starting in the field of data science education. That is true, although as I, I, I feel like my role as a old person in the field is always to remind us that we do have some knowledge based on many years of statistics education research. But, um, and one of the things I find fascinating is so how is the work that I'm doing now different from the work I might have done 20 years ago yes. um, before data science education was a term? Um, and I can offer a few reflections on that, but I want to do that a little bit later after I've shown you more about, of what we've done. Should I go ahead, Bill? Oh, yes. Okay. All right. So um, let me see if this is going to work. Yes. Okay. So we had four things that we were considered design criteria. So the main one was um, kind of the driving thing was the topic. Um, we wanted a topic that students would be interested in over this period of 10 to 12 hours um, because we really wanted to advertise. We thought about how are we going to advertise this to get middle school kids to come in the summer? And we thought, well, it had, it's not going to be like 
come analyze data. It's going to have to be come think about something they're interested in. Uh, um, and the thing I'm going to be talking about is going to be um, teens' use of technology and social media. So it seemed a lot like easier to advertise, come analyze data about social media than come learn a new tool. So, um, so we really wanted the topic to drive things. Um, but we also had to make sure that any topic had some good data sets that were already available and that um, I think Cliff is the one who said this most recently. You got to look at the data sets and make sure there's something there to be found. So uh, there's been, I would say in the last five years, a lot of people saying, oh yeah, we support kids doing data analysis. We just put our data sets up on the web and then they can do whatever they want with them. Um, and not all data sets necessarily will yield anything interesting um, to a, a relatively novice um, person who is you know, investigator data analyst. So we really had to make sure there were data sets that were accessible um, and that had something interesting in them. Um, I've given some version of this talk in places where the assumption is not that one uses code apps. The kind of the assumption here is that one uses code app and that is the tool that we use. Um, there are many things about code app that made it just right for this setting. Um, it's web-based, it's free, it can handle reasonably large data sets. It's really easy to get started with it. Um, and you'll see uh, evidence of those and also some places where we think um, we might want to push code app to, to expand some of its capabilities. And then I'll talk some about the activities that we incorporated into the module. So let me talk about topic first. Um, so as I said, uh, the fact that we're out of school. Andy, means we, we now have uh, uh, four questions in the queue. Would you like to Keep going for a while and I'll bring them up uh, when you reach a pause point. Uh, let me finish this slide and then I'd be happy to okay. entertain questions. Um, so out of school means we have freedom to choose any topic, but it also means we have to keep participants interested. So that's the plus and the minus of being out of school. Um, we went back to some old literature on curriculum to come up with this metaphor of wanting a topic to be both a window and a mirror. So in other words, we wanted students to be able to see themselves and things that they knew about in the data, but also to have it be a window onto a larger world so that they see um, what's out there beyond themselves and their community. And we, we have this um, desire to have some potential for action. I don't think we got to that in this particular module that I'm going to tell you about. Um, but kids at this age are very interested in, in social justice and um, making a difference in the world. And so we're trying to incorporate that into, um, into the modules. But as I said, I don't, we didn't quite get there with this one. So the way we chose our topics is um, with a youth advisory group. We had some kids in Maine and some in Massachusetts. And we just vetted topics with them and said, so do you think you'd be interested in looking at data on such and such? And we would show them a couple graphs. And one of the early things we came up with was sleep because there had been a big article in the newspaper about sleep. And we thought it was fascinating because kids tend to have to get up too early for school. And we thought this had a chance for, you know, some action. So we showed them the sleep graphs and they were like, Eh, but they said, oh, this graph that shows how if you watch your screen before you go to sleep, you don't sleep as well, that's really interesting. And I don't want my sister to end up watching her iPad late at night. And so we were off into this technology realm and they all agreed, yes, we want to see data on social media and technology. So it came directly from this group. Um, we also, um, have a module that's being developed on tick-borne diseases. Um, it's being developed at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, so diseases such as Lyme, which is in the news a lot and kids um, are aware of and concerned about. 
Um, we have, those two are being developed and then the, the two others that we're not sure about, one of them is about what happens to animals in animal shelters, um, who gets adopted, how long it takes, whether certain animals get adopted less frequently than others. That was very popular in Maine. Turns out not as popular in uh, urban areas because a lot of kids don't live in places where they can't have pets. So where that one's still a little up in the air. And then um, we thought about doing something on sports injuries. Um, so those are, you know, a year from now, I can do another webinar and tell you which ones we ended up with. But the first two are the ones that we're definitely doing. And the first one is the one that I'll be talking about. Um, okay, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, so I realized that we have, have only two questions in the queue. And wow. those of you who are writing comments in the, in the chat, I think I won't uh, raise those comments because every, everybody can read them. Uh, so the first question is from Rob Lippincott. Uh, when did data science education emerge as a term? Ooh, do I have to answer that? Um, I could help out. Yeah, would you try first? <laughs> uh, we had a conference in February of 2017 called Data Science Education Technology. And at that time, we weren't sure that attendees to the conference would buy the term data science education. So um, it was a term in the air at that time but there were other things that might have sub, uh, taken over instead of that term, like data literacy. Um, and uh, so I would say in the 2015, 17 uh, time period. The uh, other question is um, how many students will you be, and this is from Joe Louie, how many mm -hmm. students will you be working with and how will you be measuring whether you're achieving your goals? And you may want to postpone that until you get to that part of your talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can say a little bit. Um, we'll have these three modules. Each one will be done twice in each state. So that's four times three is 12. And well, this summer we had 20, we had over 20 students, um, which I think was a little too much for me. But um, let's say we have 20 students. So that's 250 students-ish. Um, we proposed two different um, instruments to be developed. Um, and we haven't, we, we've just started on both of them. One of them is this interview instrument um, to see if students are able to discern what questions are answerable from um, any particular data set. Um, so that one would be one that we would do um, pre-post. Um, and then the other is a survey instrument on data dispositions that um, we're, again, just starting um, to work on. And we know there's some other people like Jackie, who's on, our, on the call, who are also thinking about what it means to have data dispositions. Um, so those are, those are the two formal instruments that we'll be developing. Um, we also have uh, all of the work that students have done, and I'll be showing some of that at the end. Um, so we haven't yet developed a rubric for that, but um, we're hoping to. We also have evaluations um, that we've done, and we'll be doing interviews of, of some students um, this fall. Who have, some students who were in our summer session will be doing interviews with this fall. So that's a, a range of things that we're going to be pursuing. Great. Okay. I'll go on to the next slide. Um, so I, I, I like this slide as much mostly because of the picture. So um, I, gave, I was asked to give a, a keynote at a data literacy. So this is a place where actually data literacy had cut on um, workshop a couple of years ago. And um, I started thinking about the, the, the whole idea of big data and how we've now gotten enamored of big data. Um, and then I also thought about 
the data that most students deal with in schools, which I would call small data. Um, and how the important thing is going to be to find data sets that are just right in the Goldilocks and the three bears sense that they're not too big because a really big data set can be pretty overwhelming. And if we're talking about students who've had very little experience with data, that's probably too much. And a data set that doesn't have anything really interesting going on in it, I would consider too small. So I was giving this talk at the New York Hall of Science and I said, you know, I'd really like a little chair, a medium sized chair and a big chair so I can tell the Goldilocks and the three bears story. And so they had a little one and a medium sized one and they built me that big one. So um, I don't think I've ever had anyone build me a chair before, but apparently it's now a big photo op thing for selfies at the New York Hall of Science. Um, but, I, but I think the point of the whole thing really is, is that we, we need to figure out what makes a data set both manageable and interesting um, and what kinds of relationships are kind of hidden in there to be found um, and the ones that we often present students with uh, often don't have a whole lot in them. Um, and what we learned this summer is um, when I show you the data that we used this summer, you'll, you'll actually see that there was an awful lot of categorical and ordered categorical data in it, which I hadn't thought about ahead of time. And I'm so used to thinking about numerical data with a few categorical variables, um, and I hadn't thought through how to deal with um, ordinal variables in particular and how to help students think about how to compare distributions of ordinal variables. So that's something we'll get back to later, but it's um, in addition to a data set needing to be the right size, I now have added to that that need to think about the different types of variables as well. Um, let me know if I should pause for any other questions, Bill. I will, and there aren't any now. Okay, all right, so um, this is just a, you know, describing really what CODAP does for us, but um, I think it's useful having this set of criteria. Um, so it needed to be accessible for middle school students and CODAP certainly is. It can deal with large-ish, whatever that means, data sets. Um, because we were so interested in this idea of cases and attributes, um, it needs, any tool needs to make the difference between cases and attributes clear. And, and any tool that I would consider using does that, but just to point out that Excel doesn't really. So um, this is partly the slide is to talk to people about why they shouldn't be using Excel. Um, it was very important that um, CODAP, as well as its predecessors, links multiple representations of the same data. I, I think that's um, an incredibly powerful um, thing that, that CODAP does um, and that allows people to see relationships that they wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Uh, I just think it's um, indispensable. And then the other piece is that, um, and I think Tim, who is on this call has talked about the importance of filtering and looking at subsets of data. Um, as data moves, things that um, really are germane to looking at big data sets and germane to data science. Um, and CODAP makes that pretty simple um, and students are, find it easy to use. So, as I said, this is like a description of CODAP, but um, it could be used as a way to think about other tools as well. All right. Um, and then the activities. Um, so for those of you who haven't read Tim Erickson's blog, um, he's been trying to say what, what makes something be data science as opposed to statistics. And one of his criteria is that criterion is, you know, one of his criteria is that 
you should feel a wash in data. So the data should be big enough and complicated enough that you don't see everything all at once so that it invites you in to be, uh, to explore. And also that making sense of the data should involve using data moves, as I mentioned, things like filtering, subsetting, um, and summarizing and aggregating. And I don't know if you want to say any more about that, Tim, or if you could put the link to your blog and especially the smelling like data science entry in the chat, that might be good. Stefania just did that. Thank you, Stefania. Oh, fabulous. Um, and then we wanted to, given that we have these kids in the summer, um, we knew we had to have relatively short activities um, and we wanted them to, to analyze um, a large data set and do some data collection of their own. Um, and you'll see how that turned out. And we, as much as love computer representations, we also wanted to involve them in some uh, hand drawing of a particular type, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Um, so this, I think, was one of the more unusual parts of the work we did, and um, I, I just want to, I'll talk about it in a few minutes. Um, okay, I am moving on now to talk about the actual module, the Teens and Technology module. So if you have any questions about the general criteria, um, this would be a good time to ask them. Oh, we're all anxious to see the actual activities. Okay, I'll go on. I was, I was trying to do the, you know, good wait time. I have to say it's very strange. I'm used to hearing people's reactions when I talk and there's like this great silence. And so um, it's very strange to do this. I haven't really done this before. So I'm thinking, I just said something funny and nobody laughed. So. Yeah. I think we, we could use the <laughs> track um, in, in order to make this make it better for you. Okay. All right. All right. I like that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but meanwhile, I will go on. Okay. So um, the teens and technology module that we did, let me tell you a little bit about the participants. Um, so we work with a, a local um, Y in Malden, for those of you who are in the Boston area. Um, the Malden Y, whose catchment area is basically Malden, Medford, and Everett. Um, their community programs person is fabulous. So if you ever want to work with a community group, just let me know and I will connect you up with him. Um, he, he just knows the community really well and has been working at the Y for many years. They have programs during the summer. Um, they have a robotics program, they have a chemistry program, they run them out of Malden High School. And the way that we got integrated into that was to um, get kids after the robotics program. So we had kids from like 2.30 to 4.30, um, two weeks in a row. So the good news is that these are kids who have decided or their parents have decided that they're going to do something academic in the summer. Um, that's also the bad news. They may not be totally representative. Um, the other bad news is that um, they had just been there for six hours or five hours. And so we had to make sure that what we were doing was at least as exciting as what they were doing in the robotics camp, which sometimes was true. And other times we lost them to their playing video games. So that's, that's life. Um, and we had about 23 kids. Most of them came most of the days. Um, and they were an extremely diverse group, um, lots of ethnic differences, um, and ranged in age from, I think I said, 11 to 15. Uh, so the hook um, was this article that luckily was on the front page of the Boston Globe about four months ago, um, probably a little longer ago than that, maybe May. 
Um, and it was on teen social media use. I have to say having something in the newspaper doesn't mean a thing to most kids. I said, have you all seen this article? No. Um, but the um, headline was 45% of teens said they're online almost constantly. And that percentage has nearly doubled in just a few years. Um, so in 2014-15, just 24% of teens said the same thing. So this was just our starting a conversation with them about this phenomenon of kids being on social media a lot or being on the internet a lot. Um, now the data set, so this is kind of interesting. Um, the data set actually preceded that article in the Globe. Um, so the Pew Research Center does um, large scale surveys once every few years on, well, on many topics. And they come back to this topic of technology use and internet use every couple years. And they make their data available, which is really lovely. Um, they don't make it available until a few years after they collect it. So um, they want to squeeze everything out of it they can before they release it. But when they release it, they release it with, now I'm hoping this is going to work, they send out the actual interview. So tell me if you see something that says teen relationship survey on your screen. Yes. Good. Okay. That's what Talia and I practiced and it works. So this is the actual survey. And I will um, show you that it is very long. It's 37 pages long. Um, and the way that this survey was administered, whoops, sorry, I did not mean to do that, um, is that they first contacted parents and then they said to the parents, um, do you have any kids in your house between 13 and 17? And if so, can you nominate one of them to take the rest of the survey? So the case in this data set is actually kind of funny. It's a family, um, but we were mostly, we were really looking at the children's responses, the teenagers' responses. But because of the structure, when we got to the data, there were a lot of missing cases, a lot of missing variables. Um, so we had to do a lot of work on the data before we could use it. Um, and I wanna show you the last question in this, which we didn't end up actually using, but it's just a very interesting question. So you see the very last question, was there anyone in the room who watched or helped you take the survey? So that is a question to the teenagers asking them if their parents were looking over their shoulder the whole time. Um, Mostly that answer seemed to be no. Um, but this survey has a lot of questions that we did not use, like the ones on your screen right now. Um, we didn't think that we could actually have those discussions with the kids we were talking to without a lot of issues. So the ones we did use though are somewhere in the middle here. Um, so not the dating ones, but these kinds of things. Do you have access to any of the following items? Um, how many text messages do you send and receive on your cell phone? Do you do any of the following online? Play video games, use Pinterest? Um, do you do any of the following using WhatsApp or Kick? So um, many of you might be aware of these things, but I have to say a lot of these things were not um, like polyvore. I had never heard of it before. So I got a good um, education in social media. Um, let's see, I'm going to try, let's, oh yay, it works. Okay, so I said there was, this was a parent and child combination interview. There were about um, 1,200 cases. There were over 300 variables. Um, and I will tell you more about what we had to do to prepare these data in a bit. Um, I don't know, is Tracy, are you online? Tracy Higgins? Um, um, yeah. Okay, so 
I just want to say that Tracy Higgins is the person who did most of the data wrangling. So when we get to that point, I might ask her for, um, to make sure that I'm representing it correctly. Um, but this is, uh, but I, I will say that in terms of data science, I think that having a real data set that has already been collected is one of the things that, that might distinguish data science from statistics. So we often just start with a small data set that kids have collected. Um, and it, it brings up all kinds of issues in terms of data prep that we don't really want students to deal with. So you have to factor that into your prep time. And oh, and let me say, I am totally happy to share our, um, our data that we have organized and fixed up and for anybody who wants to use it. Um, I don't know if I put it in the drive, but I'm happy to. So if you're interested in that, I'm happy to do that. Andy, could you just say a little bit about the decision not to involve the students in the, in the data wrangling? Yes. Um, some of it is kind of boring. Um, like, see if see which cases have a lot of missing values and get rid of them. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess if we had more time, I could make an argument for getting kids involved in the data wrangling. But given the amount of time we had, I wanted them to be able to discover some things about the data and they couldn't have done both. I would add to that that the, the wrangling uh, requires a perspective about data that these young people have not yet acquired. Mm -hmm. Andy, could I ask a quick question about that? Oh, hi, how are you? Yes. Hey, I'm good, thanks. Um, so I'm really interested in this wrangling piece, um, so I understand that it's time intensive and it's not always clear that you're making progress when you engage kids in that kind of wrangling. But given that one of your main goals was for students to understand this, um, the difference between, I think what you called life, real life and mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. what I understand to be like, uh, what it means to turn qualities of the world into quantities or operationalize the world or that sort of thing. It seems like the, the wrangling, all the, like myriad of choices that you make along the way and alternative choices that could have been made um, isn't it would be an important piece to understanding the relationship between life and data so how did you guys think about that learning goal and that instructional choice right um so even with all the wrangling um there were plenty of those issues that arose so for example um we shared with them the, the interview and exactly how the questions were stated. And they, in some cases said, oh, I see, that's the way that was asked. Well, then that wouldn't tell you so-and-so. So sharing with them the actual data collection protocol laid out some of those questions in a way that I think was much more immediate than if they had to figure out what's missing data. Um, sometimes there were questions that had, that were multiple choice that had like five or six choices and they would say, oh, but they didn't include this one. So they wouldn't find out about that. So it was in looking carefully at the actual data collection protocol that they realized that you get answers to the questions you ask and the questions you ask may not actually be the information you want. Does that make sense? Yeah, what, what I'm hearing you say is that the one way of supporting that goal would be to have kids invent the data collection protocol, possibly in different ways, compare the different approach, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but another strategy that uh, would at least be more efficient is to have a set pre previously used data collection protocol and let them engage with that protocol and uh, themselves discuss, you know, given how these things are operationalized, what can we learn? What can we not learn? Yes. And um, 
I think that is the way that we, that we all encounter data more and more is somebody else collected it and we have to say, is, is their measurement really reflective of what, of the information that we want? So it feels very authentic in that when you read that stuff in the newspaper, um, it's all about the collect data collection instrument and they don't usually give it to you, but we luckily had it to give them. I also want to say that um, almost immediately upon looking at the very first graphs that we showed them, when we were just demonstrating Kodak, like here's the tool you're going to be using and here's what's going to happen. Um, they were aware immediately that these data were four years old. And the reason is that Facebook is dead, according to them. And the data showed that Facebook was pretty popular. So they said they just didn't trust the data from that perspective. They knew immediately that these data were not describing their world. And we said, yep, yeah, that's why you're going to collect some data and see if it's different. Um, so we were actually kind of first appalled that we had this data that were um, not current and then realized that we could make an opportunity out of that. So that's the other way in which they were um, pretty critical of the data. Should I go on or is there, are there more people who want, or are there more comments on that? I'm hearing go on. Is that right, Bill? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so this is just, um, again, I, if some of these slides are borrowed from a presentation where there were a, was a much more variable audience. So um, this is just that this is a CODAP graph. This is um, showing a, an ordinal variable on the x-axis, a categorical variable on the y, and then colored by gender. Um, and notice that the x-axis that these are actually ordered in a reasonable way, which is not the way that is a default. I mean, obviously the default in CODAP is alphabetical because how else would you do it? Um, so just, to, just wanted to show this as, this is the kind of graph that we tended to get a lot of um, because there were a lot of these ordinal and categorical variables. Um, we also, this was, as, as much as I, I love the, CODAP um, uh, layered um, nested file um, variable structure, it didn't really come in so much to our, uh, into this particular data set, but um, jumping to something that I'll, that I'll say at the end, but just it seems appropriate now, because we're driven by topic and by data set that we found, our modules actually um, have very different data structures. So the, the Lyme disease one actually has um, time series within states. So it is a nested data structure and it has time series in it, which this particular data set doesn't. So we're finding that we're having to come up with different strategies, different pedagogical strategies for different uh, modules because of the uh, centrality of the, of the data sets that we're using. Okay, so here's the part that I think is a little bit um, unusual. So um, our team is kind of in love with this book called Dear Data. Um, and for those of you who don't know about the book, it's about two women who are graphic artists, um, but are also data lovers. And they met somehow and decided to get to know each other by exchanging a postcard a week that has a data representation on it. And um, I, I totally recommend buying this book. Um, it is gorgeous. The data representations are fascinating and it's just a different cut on data and communicating with and about data. Um, the way they did it was to choose a topic, each <laughs> week, Gesundheit, and then to um, decide independently what about that topic they were going to collect and then create 
representation and very importantly, create a legend for the representation that showed, that showed how they were representing each attribute. So we decided to do this partly because we, we wanted to appeal to a more artistic side of some of the students. And we realized that the, the pedagogical piece of it is to focus on this idea that an attribute is represented in a particular way in a representation. Um, and that there are actually many, many choices. Um, any tool, any computer tool that we have has a limited number of choices, but, um, but there are many other choices that if you have paper and pen, you can um, avail yourself of. And here is um, one of the representations from that book. This is a, a week of phone addiction. And you can see in this case, she's organized it by day. So there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Sunday. Yeah, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. She did an awful lot of texting on Friday, which um, anytime I've had kids look at this, they've said, oh, she must have been figuring out her weekend plans. Um, and you can see that this person has used position, um, both vertical and, and horizontal, uh, and color. Um, maybe that's all in this case, um, to represent her data over the course of the week. Um, so we show kids a couple of these to give them a general idea idea of what kinds of representations are available and I will show you later what they came up with. Okay, um, I'm going to talk some about the data preparation um, and again Tracy if I if there's anything that I say that's either wrong or you think it should be like expanded upon let me know. So the data were available so this is kind of like down in the weeds stuff as both CSV and SPSS from the Pew website. Um, we first downloaded the CSV. It turned out that um, a lot of the information about the mapping of the variables to um, that interview that I showed you, the questionnaire was not in the CSV, but it was in the SPSS. Um, so once we figured that out, that was very helpful. Um, and Pew, um, and I think this is probably true of many data providers, they put the data up, they put the questionnaire up, they don't, don't have a lot of people hanging around to ask it to answer questions. So um, you're kind of on your own once you access data. Um, I've actually been in touch also with um, uh, Common Sense, which does similar kinds of work, and they don't make their um, data available at all, maybe. And it's really their, their job is not to make their data available. So just so you know, if you're using um, data like this, uh, you won't necessarily get complete documentation. So add in some time to really dig into the data set. There was lots of missing data. There were you know, ne various negative numbers for things like not asked and not sure. And they were minus 98, minus 99. And we didn't know which was which. and um, so that was a, another whole bunch of things that Tracy had to do. Um, I think, let me make, let me see if I actually did this right. <laughs> yes, okay. This is actually the CSV. Um, I just put this up to show you what the raw data looked like. And you can see that, um, the variable names are, you know, are just what's in the survey and uh, it's, I don't know how many columns, but you know, like 300 and some and yeah, I can just keep scrolling and so this is what we got and uh, this is what we had to work with. Um, so obviously you're not going to give kids things with uh, variable names like QS2, so we had to rename everything. Um, I, I, I'm sure you all get that. Um, and then we had the question of there are 1,200 cases, even when Tracy took out the ones that were had a lot of missing values or you know there's something else wrong with them, we still had, I think, 600 and some. We thought that was too many, so um, Tim taught us this very cool thing of using set-aside, which um, 
will actually, why don't I let Tim describe that because he'll do a better job than I will. I'm, I'm not sure what, how to describe. Um, in CODAP, you can make a selection in your data and um, set aside either the ones you've selected or the ones you have not selected, and then all subsequent analysis uh, respects that set aside. And of course, other uh, data analysis programs and platforms can do similar things. But for me, anyway, when, um, when I connect this with the hierarchical data structures, it's easy to find and um, describe subsets of the data and just get rid of the rest of them. And you could also, of course, have deleted uh, many of these cases as an alternative because you don't want the students to get them. And I, I assume you deleted the ones you didn't want ultimately, but as a step along the way, set aside is a useful tool. Is that what you want, wanted me to? Yes, that was perfect, yes. Okay. Um, we actually, um, as it turns out, we didn't delete them. Well, we didn't want to because we weren't sure we had the right number and we didn't want to have to go back to scratch to, you know, like, let's say we, oh, we really wanted 350, not 200. We didn't want to have to start all over. So that's why we use set aside and not delete. Um, but it did turn out that at some point students asked to see all cases and I think they came back. So, but anyway, it was, it was a, a wonderful thing to discover. So. Uh, so Joe has a question. Um, okay. Uh, she says, I see that there were weights that accompanied the data. Did you decide to have students work uh -huh. the weights or did you weight the data for them or did you ignore the weights? We ignored them. Um, we never, I mean, we kind of understood what the weights were um, and we know they, they were used by Pew, um, but that seemed to be not something we wanted kids to have to worry about. So that was one of the columns that got deleted pretty early on. Um, and now I'll make a comment about Go ahead. Okay, I'll make a comment about that issue. Yes, yeah, so when you're doing real actual statistical analysis, like it's your business, of course the weights are really important. Right. Um, but if you have enough cases and we're just trying to show kids how, what data might look like, and so they can draw some kind of conclusions, even if their conclusions might turn out to be statistically invalid if you were to use the weights, um, I really support the avoiding of weights. When I ran a high school class for long enough and had enough time, and we were using US Census data that had weights involved, I did end up teaching them about the weights. But conceptually, it just starts to make something that's really, really hard because you're saying, oh, I want to um, take this case and this case represents five people in the population or 2,700 people in the population. How can I figure out what the actual distribution is? And now you're getting into some a, a really strange combination, from the student's point of view, a strange combination of doing aggregate calculations and doing calculations with the individual cases. And so, you know, when you're an undergraduate, absolutely, you have to deal with the weights, but I, I totally sympathize with <laughs> at this point. We did uh, uh, quite a lot of work over the years with the Minnesota Population Center, and um, they provide a lot of census data with weights. And we asked them, well, how do you deal with weights? And um, they said, well, of course, in our work, we do deal with them. But the people we work with, demographers, social scientists, they have a lot of trouble with weights. And so <laughs> we strive to find ways to make it simple for them uh, to understand what's going on. Yes, so yes, with middle school kids, we thought that was beyond the pale. So there's another question here from Becca. She said, she asked, mm -hmm. was the wrangling process mentioned as part of the introduction to the data set? 
Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I can't remember if we did or not. Um, but oh, that would have been an interesting thing to do. I now see that Tracy answered it. I oh, think okay. Is that true? Tracy says our focus was more visualization, not formal statistics. No. That may have been an answer to the um, waiting question also. Yeah, that was waiting. The, um, I think in terms of the, I think some of the data wrangling that we did, I don't think we talked a lot about that with the kids. And part of it is we had 10 to 12 hours total and we were doing them as data. We were, you know, the dear, di the dear data work, the playing around with just trying to figure out functionality of code app. So they had like challenges they were working on to see like what they could do with code app and right. And then playing with the data and, tr and learning how to make graphs. So I think we sort of, there are all kinds of cool things we could have pursued, but I think that, you know, there's just some things that we were just like, we don't have room for everything. Yeah. And I, can I just ask a question? This is Joe, just to yeah. throw in there. Yeah, so it wasn't uh, an important means for engagement to be able to have students feel that what they're reporting is representative and is, I don't know, quote unquote, true, some true trend from across the population. That's not something that was really um, important that you wanted to highlight any trends that they might be pulling out of the data to be able to say, oh, this is real. This is, this is what's reflective of the population. Well, I think that given that we had given them a randomly selected um, subset of the data that had 200 cases in it, I would say that at least at the level they were looking at things, that it was pretty representative. I'm not sure if you're asking that question about the weights or if you're asking that question about the wrangling. Okay, um, about the weights. About, about the, the weights. weights. Oh. Yes. Um, no, I, I actually think that it was that what they were finding, at, you know, at least at the degree of precision that they were finding it, that um, it was, the things they were seeing were representative, I think. I think that, I mean, and Tim also, I think also said, you know, if you have, a, if you're not talking about a very small, you know, like if you disaggregate and you are talking about small ends, I think the weights might be more important, but at the level that they were doing the analysis, I don't think the weights would have made much difference. Yeah, I think one issue is, are the weights very different from one another or are they kind of in the same range? So that if, if you have inadvertently deleted a bunch of people with very high weights, mm -hmm. then you might get something that happens that's, that's genuinely wrong. But I do think that most of the effects that we're seeing, that when we look at them, we're not looking for small, tiny effects. We're looking at great big hit you in the forehead effects and trying to make visualizations that make those things clear. And so when students make the visualization, kind of like what uh, Tracy was saying in her comment on, online, the students make the visualization and it either rings true to them or, or somehow surprises them and also rings true that's the kind of thing I imagine you're looking for. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. So I was just going to, because I've been looking at, with the, if I remember correctly, um, with that data set, the, it wasn't, so some of the issues helped um, with slight difference, differences in subpopulations compared to the nation as a whole. But they weren't huge. They weren't hugely off in their sample. In their sampling, they were actually pretty good. And they did a second round of of surveying where they tried to um, get some more from some underrepresented populations. So the actual final set. I mean, they had to put in those weights for really precise statistics. But the data set as a whole wasn't was pretty close to a nationally representative sample. 
I also think that um, if we had a lot more time and we were, they, we were using the data for them to write to their congressman about something that we would be more concerned about that. But I think that um, I, I liked Tim's description of the, you know, looking for patterns that are really, um, a statistician friend of mine used to say, have the intraocular effect, right? They hit you between the eyes. Um, and then saying, well, why am I surprised or how might that have changed in the last four years? Um, that's really where we were aiming. So let me go ahead. I don't wanna um, run out of time for showing the kids work. So I'm gonna go ahead, is that okay? Yes. All right. All right. Um, and I might skip a few things just to make sure that we get to the end here. Um, I'm not actually gonna show you, the, well, maybe I'll show you this one data set. We ended up deciding that we were gonna create three different data sets that had different themes because we felt we had so many variables and we didn't want kids to have data sets with 40 or 50 variables. So we did something which I think we won't do again, which is to make three thematic data sets, one on internet use, one on that Tracy called Friends in the Digital Age, which I think is a great topic, a great title, and one on video games. Um, and then we assigned kids, or they chose which of those they wanted to investigate. It got very complicated. So I would say Tracy has since then created a data set that goes across all three and has about 20 variables that we'll probably use next time. Um, but they did have 200 cases in them. And then um, we ended up having them collect data that we added to those. And I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but I wanna go through what happened in the module and then you'll understand where that came from. So here are the five days that we, um, the activities we did on the five days. We made some human graphs. I can go into detail on any of these at some other point. Um, we introduced the topic. We had kids share, we gave them each a case, uh, a representation of a case and had them talk through what they knew about that person. This kind of um, borrowed from uh, what Tim and Bill have done with the census. Um, we, and then we introduced CODAP. And one of the, as I said, one of the first things they said when they saw these very first data sets is, these data are old, so immediately we thought, okay, we're going to, to investigate this change over time. Um, we did some challenge cards um, as a way of getting them familiar with aspects of the CODAP tools. And we did a um, Dear Data activity on screens that I will describe in a bit. Um, so the third day was a big day. So we introduced these three themed data sets and we asked students which question, which things do you think might have changed over time or shown gender differences? This was a, a pretty complicated thing to ask them and I'm not sure we would do it like this again, but our purpose was to get, we wanted them to collect some data over the weekend and we wanted them to have a relatively small number of questions to focus on. So we wanted them to help us choose the questions that we thought, that they thought might show change over time, that is a difference between what they collected and what Pew had collected, or would show interesting gender differences because a lot of the variables show differences between gender. And we asked, we set up a, some data collection sheets and had asked them to collect data over the weekend. Um, not surprisingly, very few of them did, um, which we kind of knew, but we were hoping they would. So when they came back the next week, they collected data from one another and from the coaches that were, we had um, a bunch of high school kids who were working with us. So they did that data collection. We did another Dear Data activity on shoes. Um, we did a mystery graph activity. And then the final day, um, I worked like crazy adding all the data they had collected to each of the data sets. So there were now these three augmented data sets 
that had both the Pew data and what we called the Malden data in them. And the last day they created um, final projects um, on some question that they found interesting. And I have a bunch of those to show you. Um, so is it clear how we augmented the data sets? That's the thing I want to make sure that people get before I go on. I guess so. Uh, Rob has a question. Sure. Was collecting their own data a key to engaging the students? It's an interesting question because one of the things we've decided we would do differently is we would have them collect data first before they, before they had done much with the Pew data set. And the reasons are one, that we do think that they would be more engaged, but more than that, these questions were kind of complicated. And we felt that when they were doing the final analysis, they were still understanding some of the intricacies of the way the questions were asked. And in some cases, they had asked the questions not exactly the same way they had been asked by Pew, as you'll see that in some of the final products. Um, so if they had actually asked, done the data collection first, we think they would have been more familiar with the questions rather than um, getting to that later. So that's one of the things we're hoping to, we're planning to change is to do the data collection part earlier and not, and I think we will choose the questions that they'll be asking one another. Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> okay, I have to stop and have a drink of water. Hang on. Okay. All right. So let me talk about the Dear Data representations, because um, I found this a really interesting part of the module. Um, and I'll just talk about the first one. So um, they collected data about screens. So remember, we were in a high school, and um, they pretty much had the run of the school if they were accompanied by these teenage coaches. So and also remember this is summer, so we really needed them to be moving around and doing something other than sitting in front of the computer. So we divided them into teams and they ran around the school literally and collected data on screens. And we decided ahead of time that the three characteristics they would collect data on were size, whether it was on or off, and whether it was being watched or not. But they realized ahead of time, I mean, we had this discussion, they had to decide what counted as a screen. And um, we had said, well, look, there are screens in the computer lab and there are screens on the phones. But they said, but what about the exit sign? That's kind of a screen. And they discussed it and decided that a screen had to be changeable and had to be reflecting information. So an exit sign didn't count because it never changed. I thought that was a actually a really wonderful definition that emerged from this activity. And then they had to decide on size, what, how to decide small, medium, and large. And they decided small meant it could fit in your pocket. Medium meant you could carry it around. And large meant you couldn't move it. So when they got to the gym, the scoreboard counted as a large screen because it displayed changing information and couldn't be moved. So that discussion, I thought, was, was worth the whole thing to begin with. Um, and then they came back and they struggled to figure out how to represent three, character, three attributes at once. But I'm going to show you some of their representations. So um, can you see these pictures now, or a picture? Yes. OK, good. So um, they also collected where they found these screens. And 
um, even though that wasn't one of the variables, they had a hard time not putting that in. So um, this person used kind of a, um, a three column, I mean, this is almost like a spreadsheet, um, but with colors rather than um, words. So that was one um, approach. This person used something very much like CODAP actually. So they had an on off on the Y axis, small, medium, large on the X axis. And then they had, um, they colored the, um, the, the dots to show whether something was being watched or not. This is my favorite one. So this one ha uses color for um, size, um, position for on or off, and two different icons for watched and unwatched that are basically a closed eye and an open eye. Um, and then finally, this one, um, which used um, position um, on the y-axis for size, um, shading for watched and unwatched, and color for on and off, but then also this person really wanted to say where everything was. So um, we used these uh, to talk about how each characteristic, each attribute, I keep trying to say attribute, was represented. And we had a, a, an interesting discussion about the possibilities of um, how you could represent different attributes, um, not just on a graph. I mean, it's so a lot of people really just, did just think about these two axes um, or the kind of spreadsheet version. Um, but I think it was, it was an interesting exercise in that it um, showed people the, the wide range of representational possibilities. So um, that, are there any questions about that? Sorry, I didn't mean to close it quite so abruptly. So uh, Dan asks with a wink, did you find any screens that were off but watched? <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, I would have to go back and look at the representations, but um, was that Dan Damelin asking yeah. that question? <laughs> Part of the reason I asked that is because it actually has implications for thinking about structuring data and potential hierarchical organizations or things like that. If, mm -hmm. if, oh. if there's no more possibility that it's off and being watched. Like, do you think about the grouping the data differently? Interesting. Well, I would say, given the way kids stare at their phones, probably yes. <laughs> Waiting for it to come on. And I was curious, in the ones that you showed us, it didn't appear that anyone used size to represent size. Oh, that's very interesting. Did they? Um, I think somebody did. Um, I would have to go look. Um, and, and this work you just showed us, this is after they have done or seen some of these dear data type representations, is that correct? They had seen one or two, that's all. Because many of them are, are actually quite hard to, um, to parse, so we didn't want to show them too many. We also didn't want to, we did talk about the fact that they saw some CODAP graphs before this, so they had that as um, a kind of uh, prompting mechanism, you know, recency effect, but they also had seen a couple of dear data things. And in the beginning, you talked about the importance of their, uh, the goal of getting students to uh, understand case and attribute. Did mm -hmm. you um, see much, confusion during this particular project? Um, I would not say there was confusion about, about case and attribute um, in case. When we talked about the dear data representations, because after we talked about how did you, you represent these three attributes in your representation, 
we went back to that one that I, the Dear Data one that I showed you. And I said, so what's the case in this? And that was really hard because the case is one, one experience with my phone. And so people said, a text message, a phone, a person, it was a really hard question. So um, we finally got to one touch of my phone, but um, I would say that's where the, the confusion about case came in, was looking at those representations, which they hadn't made, they were interpreting. So uh, Stefania has a very interesting question, which I'm not gonna read, I'll ask her to explain her question out loud if you're willing. Sure. Uh, I was actually sending this to Rob and <laughs> by accident. Uh, yeah, so I was curious, um, um, basically, like how their language, um, because that will reflect how much they understood some of these concepts you're trying to mm. get across, changed, right? So uh, when they were presenting these visualizations, did they give feedback to each other? Did you notice that they would like influence each other in their presentations and the language they would use? And if over time, um they would develop like a stronger like a more consistent way of talking about these and then the other thing that would be super interesting is if they were designing for a specific audience in mind because mm -hmm. that would show an extra level of reflection where they have to think not only how they would represent this data but also like how they would do it in a way that someone else would be able to understand it as well so yeah, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that. And if you recorded their conversations and um, encoded for some of these questions. Right. Oh boy, would, do you have any graduate students or would you like to come and do that? Um, we, have, we do have video of the whole thing. And um, if they were presenting, we have video of that. And we had a fabulous videographer who would, who would go over to small groups and occasionally videotape smaller conversations. Um, the second time we did this, when we did it about shoes, um, I had wanted to pair kids up and have them switch representations and then say what they could learn about the other person's representation from, and it, but it didn't quite happen. So um, that's another thing we'll be sure to do next time. So I would say they, Definitely, we're not thinking about audience at this point. That, that's a little further down the road. Um, in terms of language, I would say that they got better over the days about talking about case and attribute. Um, and when we asked them at the end, did they learn any vocabulary? A, a couple of them said they learned case and attribute. Um, I think if we had had successfully paired them and asked them to interpret one another's representations without help. I think what ended up happening, because I was in the other room entering data, I think what ended up happening is that they just described to each other what they had done, as opposed to saying, here, can you understand my representation? And I think that would have been a great way to see how well they were communicating and hear how they, how they ask one another questions about the, their representation. So, um, so that's for the future. Um, but we do have tons of data, which we have not coded yet. Yeah, we should talk. <laughs> okay, all right, happy to talk. Um, any other questions? So shall I go ahead? I'm going to show, um, so I've gotten to the point where I'm going to show you some of what the kids made, which I think is where this is all headed. So let me show you some final projects. And these are all in the webinar folder. So um, uh, so let me just say, first of all, um, that I, I felt really dumb about this, but at one point I was thinking, oh, maybe we have to use like Google Slides for them to do posters and then they'll have to take pictures. And then I realized, no, actually, 
CodeApp has these text boxes and it has a draw tool. And so there's really no reason to do it in anything other than, um, than CodeApp. So thank you, CodeApp. Uh, so their final products were basically graphs with um, some text around them. And um, you'll see at least one student who used the draw tool um, to highlight something on, on her graph. Um, so this is a, a fairly um, uh, thing that a uh, graph that a student made. A lot of them compared, so here's the Pew and the Malden um, comparisons. So this was, Malden were the data that they collected and Pew were the data that they had um, been using. And you'll see here, unfortunately, that um, they didn't use the same categories as Pew. So they, they used yes and yes a little and not yes a lot. So here's where I think um, two things. One is if they had used the data ahead of, if they had actually collected the data at the beginning, we could have been more clear about what are the choices. Um, but also they saw that you really have to be careful what choices you give people. Otherwise, you have a hard time making comparisons. Um, and these are, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't put refused in between um, no and yes. But, um, so here, this, this person wanted to know, does social media make connecting with people worse? Um, and we have decided that many of the Pew people think that social media does not make connections worse. No one in Malden said that social media makes connections worse. A small fraction of Pew people said that um, social media makes connecting a little worse. Um, we came to these conclusions based off of the data from the graph on the right with a, an arrow. Um, there are lots of Pew and Malden dots above no. But then I really think this last thing is um, I'm still wondering how a different age range would affect the question. So they were also aware of the fact that the Pew data were um, primarily kids from 13 to 17, and their age range was more like 11 to 14. And so one of the discussions that we had was um, they didn't really feel like they could compare um, their data with Pew because it was collected um, from kids of a different age. So all of this goes into the, um, that goal of being aware that when you start measuring real life, you get data that is only an imperfect reflection of, uh, of what's really going on. So, um, so that was one, um, one graph. One thing I will say is I would have loved for them to be able to easily say, let's combine all of these yes categories, since um, we didn't make the same distinctions. And that's something that I've actually talked to Bill about a little, but it would be nice to be able to, I know there are ways to do this by um, using the hierarchical data structure, but I would love to be able to just say, hey, let's put all these three together right here on the graph. Um, so that's just a, the, Categorical data, I had some ideas of ways that it would be nice to be able to deal with it, which um, Bill might want to comment on or not. Here's a question. Yes. Um, Is that so, Tim? Yes. yes. So I, in, yes. the text says no one in Malden said that social media makes connections worse, but the graph says four people said Oh, that's really interesting. And so I was wondering if hmm. about a third, <laughs> about a third, yes. So I was wondering, who, how do we interpret this? Whoops. Um, I wonder if I've done something wrong here. Um, can I, can I no, you can punt that? on that if you'd like, sure. I might punt on that yeah. because actually I remade this graph because something happened with in the, between Google Drive and sharing and the, the graph went away and I remade it and maybe I did it wrong. Okay, I was just, I was wondering that I thought there might be some really juicy story from inside no. the class. That, oh gosh, no, I'm sorry. But, no, that's okay. 
Um, um, I want to that, draw, uh, just draw people's yes. attention to the chat because there's a lot of um, juicy uh, commentary going on there, uh, which uh, you might want to pay attention to at some point. Not, not you, Andy, but... Oh, no. okay. I was just thinking I would love to, but I don't think I can do that and no, talk at the same that. time. Okay, but if there's anything that I should be aware of and that we might want to have a discussion of, please just stop me. I, I will. Okay, thank you. All right, um, let's see. I, this is where I always, I want to close this one and open a different one. Um, how do I do this? That menu on the far left, upper there. Yeah, so. Can I just open a different one? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So this one I did not recreate. So I know it's the one he intended. Um, so there were a bunch of boys who were interested mostly in video game play. And they were interested in this question about whether playing games um, makes you happy. And here again, he's comparing the Pew data and the Malden data. Um, and again, we have this issue of yes, yes a little and yes a lot. And um, he collected data just yes and no, except for this one person. And the Pew data is yes a little and yes a lot. Um, but he also did, and part of the reason I wanted to show this one is that he um, did use the count tool and put in the percents. Um, some kids had trouble with this and they would, because you have to choose whether you want the percents to go via the rows or the columns. He's actually done it correctly here, but we had a lot of kids who would choose percent and, um, and do it via the columns in this case, which wouldn't have made sense. And it was one of those things that we didn't have time to go back to. Um, and he also points out that he was wondering what the age groups of the pew was because in Malden, he knew that they didn't use the right age group. So this was something that was floating around that day when they were making their, um, doing their final graphs, that that was an issue that didn't allow them to do good comparisons. Um, he hasn't actually made a comment though on how this, what this shows him. I think he was just thinking the age groups are different, so I don't really know what, what to say. Um, let's see. Okay. So here's one I'm gonna let you, um, read this because it's there's a lot of text and then notice that she has a graph down the bottom with um annotation on it so the, the only kid i think who did this who actually used annotation middle-aged teens i like that middle-aged teens to ask, and she has pointed out the middle-aged teens on the bottom graph, which are those between 15 and 17. And a lot of kids were making arguments about how the older teens might like Facebook more because Instagram and Snapchat were, are newer and they may have started using Facebook when they were younger because Snapchat and Instagram weren't around. So they had this um, story about how social media gets moved through the community based on age. So Andy, Rob has a, a really important question that okay. I'll just put out there now and you, mm -hmm. you address it right now. Yep. Uh, 
what do you consider to be the most important or surprising success of this activity in terms of accomplishing pedagogical goals? I would say um, I think that these students had developed an appropriate combination of appreciation and skepticism about data. That they understood the power of data collection because they did, they discovered some things that they were surprised at. And they also realized how sensitive data collection data are to when and how they're collected. Rob, did you want to um, respond to that? I think that that's, sound, sounds, you know, really great. I mean, in other words, from this age of student to get them engaged clearly was the kind of first uh, problem to solve, and, and clearly you did that, and clearly that was that was a big win. What I'm after is, in terms of the sort of ahas of data science, uh, did you feel like this was you know, illustrating the data, sort of telling the story graphically, <clears throat> or, and to get all the way to establishing both the power and understanding that and, and even establishing skepticism about data, it seems to me to be very, very strong. Do, do, you, have any do you have any evidence of how this then transferred to other kinds of thinking about data or uh, schoolwork, I mean, math or uh, uh, science or, or any other? Um, I, the plan is, um, those are questions that we actually want to pursue. So this was all of like two months ago. Um, and we're planning right. on going back and interviewing some of the kids that were in this group and asking them things like, well, first of all, what do they remember from this experience? Um, but also, do they see any connection between this and what they're doing in school? I, you know, I don't know what the answer is going to be. It could very well be no, unfortunately, um, which I wouldn't say is because this was bad. It may have more to do with school. Um, but also, we were hoping, we, we'd like to see if they remember enough that if we give them a data set and ask them if they can answer a particular question from it if they still have some ways of looking at the data that would allow them to answer that. So um, tune back in. I'm happy to do a, you know, a, like six months from now, I can tell you at least a little more about um, where they are with respect to data. Great, Great. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more to show. Um, and I'll do that and, um, and then since we still have a little bit of time, if there's any of that um, conver juicy conversation that's going on in chat um, that you want to introduce, Bill, feel free to do that. Um, so this was uh, um, probably the most sophisticated um, student. If you see her, um, her language is really astonishing. There were no female interviewees that used video games as their primary communication method. She was, uh, she was a kick. Um, and she has this graph with three variables on it and she interprets all three of them, um, including we certainly have to acknowledge the fact that the Pew interviews, interviewees outnumber the Malden ones 191 to 12, so we can't really assume a lot about Malden. That last statement I found interesting um, that in some of the other ones where students are writing about it, they didn't really take into a, a, an account of the numbers usually. Mm, yeah. The, the raw quantity, like I said, you know, younger kids don't use social media a lot. So I looked at the graph and expect a lot of nuns, but there was like three dots anywhere. Right. You know, so it was kind of interesting. Like, what does that mean and how do they interpret that? Um, it seems like it's a particular challenge that 
this idea of, in a sense, she's starting to think statistically here, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that's a challenge for younger and older kids. Yeah. And I think it's also, I mean, this idea of having um, a big sample and then a small sample um, is kind of inherent in the structure of, of the way we did this. So we wanted them to have a biggish data set, but then immediately they wanted to collect their own data, but we knew they weren't going to have 200 cases. So, you know, what do you do to um, support that? I mean, they wanted to kind of ground truth this, these data and, um, but there were only 15 of them. So that's why we tried to get them to do it over the weekend. We were hoping to get up to like 40, but we didn't. Um, so that's automatically going to happen, but we certainly wanted them to collect their own data and do this comparison. So there's kind of a built in problem there about numbers. And did, did you hear them talking about the problem of small numbers? and anything about variability if you were to do it again kinds of issues? Not that I heard. Um, that would be an interesting thing to look back at. Um, I definitely heard it. <laughs> you did? Okay, say more yeah. about that, Tracy. Um, some of the boys, because I was working with some of the boys that were doing video games and um, they were noticing both that there were a small number of Malden compared to the others that I think, I can't remember if there were no females or very few females that they had in their database from Malden. Um, so that also was making them think, well, it looks like males and females look different in the Pew Center data, but we have hardly any females in the Malden Center data, so it's hard to even know what's going on there. Um, so they were having those conversations. Actually, now I remember that when the boys collected data, they tended to collect data from the boys. And when the girls collected data, they tended to collect it from the girls. So the video games data set mostly had boys in it. And the, um, the other two data sets mostly had girls in them. I remember that now. I had forgotten that piece. So, what was it that called the small number a problem, but it's also an interesting opportunity, as is this issue around the bias of your data set. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was it that got them interested in comparing the two surveys? It was about, um, it was when they first saw which thing, which social media sites were most useful and they saw Facebook as one of the ones that came out high and they said that that's not true anymore. So it was recognizing a distinction between their experience and what they saw in the data around social media in particular. Was that the question you were asking? Yes, I think so. I, I, in some ways, it's, it's a really interesting strategy to get someone engaged in the data set. You give them, you give them results that don't agree with what they think should be true. Yep. Somebody is uh, is typing and oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and and um, I don't want to take credit for it because we didn't do it on purpose, but it just happened. <laughs> but it is a good strategy. Yeah. No. I I was thinking that if you stumbled <laughs> on this kind of interesting way to engage people. Yeah. Some data, like even even purposely finding data from you know a long time ago. Right. <laughs> that, that that they can relate to, but doesn't make any sense anymore. Yep. I can assure you that social media will continue to change. So this is probably a good strategy for now. Uh, so Dee Wynn has a question. Does oh, the, hi, Dewey. Uh, does the tool have ways to point to or highlight data to connect the text to the data? Uh, Bill, I don't know that it does, but that's no, a great idea. Doesn't. We have discussed it some. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Stefania has a question. Uh, were the participants segregated, boys, girls, or did you also have mixed gender groups? <laughs> Any segregation that happened was totally on their part. Um, so um, there. Um, 
and there was one boy who definitely preferred to be with the girls. So he was always, he had a, um, a hidden, a not so hidden agenda of flirting with all the girls. So um, there were definitely mixed gender groups, but there was also um, the one that the kids who were most interested in exploring the video games data set were almost all were I think all boys and you, you know at that it was a group mostly boys a girl isn't going to join it so um so there was some de facto segregation except for the the flirtation yeah that, that was the part I was interested in if they self-selected or grouped um based on the topics you had or the data you had and if you know that grouping was like uh, gendered um so Andy, we have uh, four minutes left and um, we could continue in this vein of asking questions or there may be summary things that you wanna say up to you. And Stefania has noted uh, that she has lots of questions. <laughs> well, Stefania is just down the street from me. So we could probably have a conversation in person even. Um, I think I actually had a slide, a lessons learned. But I think I may have said most of these, but maybe I'll just reiterate them in the last two minutes. Um, so because we're driven by topic, the different data sets have different structures and present different challenges. So I think that what we see in terms of tick-borne diseases is gonna be quite different and, and probably quite interesting in that regard. Um, I mentioned briefly this thing about ordered categorical variables and um, I didn't actually show that you can um, have to move them around on the axis, but that's something that um, have, I want to talk to Bill about more. Um, we are going to reorganize um, the data set so we just have one, and um, that I think will help a lot of the logistics. Um, and we'll have the students collect data from one another first to get familiar with the data set and make sure that they have exactly the same categories as the Pew study. So I think I mentioned all of these things throughout, but those are some of the lessons that we've learned and that will be um, changing in the next iteration. So that's, that's at least the first bit of iterative design. And um, I am happy to, to share any of the resources that we've developed with people. A lot of them are in the drive, but if there's something that you heard me talk about that's not there, I'm also happy to share that. I yeah. think that's all. <laughs> you might consider which having them collect data first, more, more like design the question and say, you know, if you want to compare to this question, will, will this work for you kind of thing, right? I just like the idea of not losing that that learning opportunity of mm. trying to figure out how you how you do comparative data. Uh, yes, yeah, that's a good idea. It's a good point. I want to go back to something you said in the beginning, Andy, that mm -hmm. um, this work connects to work in statistics education that you and many others have done, mm -hmm. and you were interested in how it might feel different. Mm. Uh, work in statistics education. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, um, I think that the work I've done previously, um, that this whole question of, um, well, having starting with a data set, most of the time I've done other work, it's been data that kids have collected or it's been relatively small data and using a, a, this kind of publicly available messy data and then having all these issues come up around its um, believability, um, it just kind of took me a little by surprise, but I think that is very much a data science issue. And what I, the way I answered Rob about um, understanding both the power and of data and having some skepticism about it, I'm not sure that would have been on the top of my mind 10 years ago. So um, that's my, just my off the top of my head thought. Well, uh, we're out of time. And this um, webinar has been recorded. 
And if you signed up through uh, Eventbrite, uh, you can we you will get a notification of uh, where you can view and share the recording with others. And so I want to thank Andy and Tracy for uh, this session today. And note that many people in the a number of people in the chat have thanked you. And uh, there are more of these webinars coming along, and we hope we'll uh, see some of you at, um, at the next webinar, which I don't remember the date of, but again, you, know, you can check that in Eventbrite or on the Concord website. So thank you all. Thank you all very much. And thank I'm, you all for coming. I'm gonna leave this up uh, running for another couple of minutes because if you want, at least on my screen, if I go to the chat window and click on more, there's a thing that says save chat. And um, some of you uh, may want to do that because there's a lot of interesting and useful information in that. So thank you, everyone. I don't get the save. Oh, yet. dear. So maybe if you save it, you can um, send it to me. I can send it to you, and I can also uh, make sure that uh, it's part of the email uh, about the um, video of it. Oh, never mind. I found it. Oh, you found it. Good. I did. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Andy. It was great. Oh, oh, good. I'm glad. You're welcome. It was really interesting. I can't wait to read the chat. Yeah. All right. I'm All right. Bye-bye. That's probably it. Okay. I'm going to hang up. <laughs>